Have your Bibles, would you turn with me to 2 Kings this morning, chapter 4? Second Kings chapter 4. How many of you have been here in the past when I've been here? Anybody? A few of you? All right. Awesome. Well, it's so good to be back with you. It really is. I'll say this. The fact that you have a pastor in a church here that's open to the moving of the Holy Spirit and open up to the gifts of the Holy Spirit and for him to be hosted and welcomed here. Don't ever take that for granted because I tell you it's a rarity today. You're blessed. Amen? You're blessed. Second Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out. Some will say cried out. She cried out to Elisha saying, your servant, my husband, is dead. <clears throat> and you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me. What do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere. Someone say everywhere. everywhere. From your neighbor's house, empty vessels. Someone say empty vessels. And do not gather just a few. And when you've come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him, shut the door. Someone say, shut the door. In fact, look at your neighbor. Say, shut the door. Behind her and her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. How many can see right there that once one vessel got filled, the oil kept running, and they had to fill more empty vessels. So that somebody say, overflow. He said to her, there's not another vessel, and then the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts, for you and your sons shall live on the rest. Father, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be in central Pennsylvania today to minister to these folks that are in this house today, God. I thank you for every life that is here in the sound of my voice, and I pray that, God, that not one person today would leave the same, but the power of your Spirit and the power of your Holy Word would go forth today and change us and transform us, renew us, strengthen us, and, Lord Jesus, would you fill us today to overflowing. In Jesus' mighty name, somebody say amen. So I want to speak to you out of 2 Kings chapter 4 today. The Bible gives us a metaphor of vessels and oil. Now, not just a metaphor, this was a true biblical story. This is not a fable, this is a biblical account. It's a true story. But there's often times when we can look in the Old Testament and we can see Jesus in the Old Testament. Aren't you thankful that he said, I didn't come to do away with the law, but I came to fulfill it. So in, in, in many times in the Old Testament, you can read a story and you can find Jesus, right? How many know we can see Jesus everywhere, right? We find Jesus in the Old Testament. You know, for an example, the blood of the lamb put on the doorposts as, as Israel came out of Egypt. And that blood that was put on the doorposts caused the destroyer to pass over. So even now, the blood of the lamb, I decree it over your household and over your life and every destructive work that came from the evil one. It has to pass over because of the blood. Can you say thank you, Jesus? But it's a type of the pure spotless lamb and the body and the blood of Christ that would be given on the cross for the shedding of blood for our sins. Man, maybe I'll just take some time and preach on the blood. Would that be all right? If you're here today and you say, well, there's sin in my life, Pastor. I'm not right with God. I don't know if heaven's my home. Jesus died for you. His blood was shed. But you have to apply the blood. I heard Reinhard Bonnke, a great evangelist, he said this one time. He said, the blood of Jesus is like a bar of soap. 
It only works if you pick it up and apply it. So if there's sin in your life and you're not like, right with God, you'll have an opportunity today before the service is over to give your life to Jesus, to turn from sin, turn from your trespasses. What does Jesus want from you? He wants all of your heart. He just wants you to turn away from your life. Receive him as Lord and Savior. Apply the blood of the Lamb. And every destructive work of the enemy has to pass you over. You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things pass away. Everything becomes brand new. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. So the type in the Old Testament of the blood shows Jesus. Well, the same is true here in 2 Kings. We can find Jesus in 2 Kings 4. The Bible says vessels. Someone say vessels. What were they filled with? Someone say oil. Vessels in the New Testament, 2 Timothy says this. 2 Timothy 19 through 21. The Lord knows who are his. And let every person who names the name of Christ, that means every Christian, every person that's received Jesus. This is what the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy. He says, listen, every person that gets saved who carries the name of Jesus let them depart from iniquity. Someone say iniquity. Keep that word in your spirit this morning because we're going to touch on iniquity a little bit today. Say that again. Say iniquity. So the Apostle Paul says, let every person who names Jesus depart from iniquity. And in a great house, and this is a, a speaking of the church because we are the house of God, us as people. Oftentimes people get confused. They think this building's the church. And I understand that you're getting ready to possibly go into a building project. That is not the church. We are the church of Jesus Christ. Peter says, a spiritual house being built up. And no other foundation can be laid but the foundation that was laid in Christ Jesus. He's the chief cornerstone. We are the petros, the, the living stones being built up upon the house of Jesus Christ. So every life that says yes to Jesus, they're added into the church. They're added into the spiritual house of God. Can you say amen? So any person that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity, but he says, but in a great house being the church, he says this. There's not only vessels, say vessels, vessels of gold and vessels of silver, but of vessels of wood and clay. Now, I don't know about you, but I would rather have a container made with gold in my house than a container made with wood. Can you say amen? If you saw the price of gold on Friday, you'd say a louder amen. He says this. Some for honor, but some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified. Somebody say useful. Useful for the master and prepared for every good work. Now, I know this doesn't go over real well in the American church because we like to live comfortably. We don't like to get outside of ourselves. We don't like to feel uncomfortable. But I tell you, God's plan for every person that names Jesus, every person that's called to be a follower of Christ, God's plan is for you, his perfect will for your life. Well, what's the will of God? Be a vessel of honor, not a vessel of dishonor. Cleanse yourself from the latter. Depart from iniquity. Serve the Lord with all of your heart. Let him fill you with heavenly oil, which we're gonna talk about today. And be somebody, the Bible says that then, then they become useful for the master, prepared for every good work. I'll say this. My first trip to Alaska, I saw what was out there, and I didn't like what I saw. I saw rape, I saw murder, I saw violence, I saw witchcraft, I saw all kinds of reasons why I'm not taking my brand new beautiful bride, you know, 16 years ago, actually 17 years ago when God called us, you know, I, I, I had like every reason in the book why I'm not moving out there. I, was on a, I fought with God for a month. I was on a bush plane ride back to Anchorage. Beautiful flight, man. Never forget it, the glaciers and the mountains. I'm looking, I'm just praying. I'm just talking to Jesus. Whole month goes on. I was out there for a month fighting with God. Why I'm not doing it? Although he's telling me you're called, son. These are the people I've, and I'm like, no, we ain't, we ain't doing it. And I'm on the bush plane ride and the Lord spoke to me. And I said these words to God. I said, God, 
surely there's somebody else. God said, I've asked many. There is no one else. How do you argue with that? I've asked many and showed me that he had asked many and people said, I'm not doing it. We're not going. So that's when I submitted and said, okay, Lord, we'll do it. And we've been doing it now for over 16 years. Say, thank you, Jesus. But God has a plan to use you. God has a plan to use you on this earth before it's eternally too late for souls. Hear me. People are slipping into eternity right now. Heaven and hell, they're a reality. They're not, they're, not, they're not just stories of the Bible. It's a reality. There's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. And it's a real place. And real people go there. And God's wanting to take the church and use it for his glory. Are you hearing me? Look at your neighbor. Say, he wants to use you. Come on, tell him. Useful for the master. But what does he use? What does God use? How many of you be honest, you say, I, and don't put your hand up because some people don't want to be used. But you be honest, say, I want to be used by God. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, what does God use? Some will say vessels of honor. Some will say vessels of gold. Some will say vessels of silver. Those are the ones the Bible says are useful for the master. I said it in the first service and I'll say it today as well. Make no mistake about it. I myself... And every person in the sound of my voice, all of us, we will stand before a holy God one day. One day. This life on this earth will be, I mean, wake up. Everybody dies one day. Are you hearing me? Unless Christ returns, we will all slip into the grave. Every person in the sound of my voice, including me, get this sobering thought in your mind. You will stand before a holy God one day at the judgment seat of Christ and you will have to give an account for what you did for Jesus on this earth. He's going to want to know, did you follow my will? Did you follow my plan? I had a perfect plan for you fashioned before the foundations of the earth, the Bible says. Did you follow the will that I had for your life or did you live for your own will? I mean, you can't follow the will of God if you're living for your own will. Somebody shout amen to that one. Amen. Can't follow the will of God when you're submitted to your own plans, your own desires, your own will. We need to get into 2 Kings 4. I could just keep going on that one, man. So we're all vessels. The truth is, in the house of God, there's either vessels of honor or there's vessels of dishonor. You notice it doesn't say there's vessels of half gold and half wood. No, they're either, they're either gold or their wood or clay. Vessels of honor, vessels of dishonor. And if anybody will cleanse himself from the latter, the old lifestyle, they'll be a vessel of honor. When I gave my life to Jesus, I mentioned it in the first service, man, I was hearing devils. Devils are real. I was hearing voices. I, there was a point I sat by Little Buffalo State Park. I'm in over Little Buffalo State. There was a point in my life, I was 17 years old, and I, I was so, man, I was so messed up. I told my mom, I said, I'm going out. I never came. I went out when the sun went down and I didn't come home till the sun went up. And I sat by Little Buffalo State Park on the edge of my tailgate. Thank God I didn't have a gun. Thank God I didn't have knives or a rope. But I sat there really contemplating if I ever wanted to live anymore. Messed up, man. So I know what's behind me. <laughs> yeah. I told Sixth Street in Harrisburg yesterday, I preached publicly outdoors. Imagine, a Perry County boy. Do you remember? Like, think of this. Just remember a few years ago when the mayor said, we don't want any Perry County scum coming down into our city. You remember that? A little bit of Perry County showed up yesterday. Someone say amen. amen. <laughs> and I told 6th Street in Harrisburg that when I was 15 years old, 15 to 6, it was before I could even drive. I was 15 years old. I was filled with such hate. Such hate. Now, some of you, I know you know my parents. And I, there's people here, you know, you knew my father. But the truth is, my father, you, you, you knew my father in his later years. You didn't know my father when I was a boy. My father wasn't around. He was never around. I was fatherless on many levels. And that wounding of my heart turned into hatred, anger. First it turned into anger. Then it turned into wrath. Then it turned into hatred. I hated the world. I'm telling you, hated the world. 
if you wore a shirt that I didn't like, I'd tell you about it. I mean, I'm telling you, like, I hated people. And I specifically hated black people. And I told that 6th Street yesterday that when I was 15, I was looking how to join the KKK. How many remember the days when they used to march in Carlisle? You remember those days? Anybody remember those days? Let me see your hand. A couple of you do. Oh, yeah, I'd be on the front page of the newspaper. I'll figure out how I can get in on all that. So when I got saved, let me tell you something. I know what Jesus broke from my life. I know the slop I came out of. I know the hog pen this prodigal son was delivered out of. Are you hearing me, somebody? And I, why in the world would I have ever allow the things of the world to creep back into my life? I want to be a vessel of honor. How about you? Vessels of honor cleanse themselves from the latter. Yes, it's the blood of Jesus that does the work. But I tell you, there's an old saying, salvation is free. But discipleship will cost you everything. Everything. Turn your back on the world. Somebody say, turn your back on the world. And you shall be a vessel of honor. The second metaphor in this real story in 2 Kings 4 is oil. The oil of the Holy Spirit. Do you notice in 2 Kings 4, the oil came from a divine realm. It did not come from the natural realm. Yes, she had a jar of oil, but as she began to pour it out, supernaturally there was a divine increase that came from the heavenly realm, that came from God Almighty, and it filled empty vessels. We are the vessels of honor. We are the vessels vessels of God. I tell you, every day, you are being filled with something. Someone say, uh-oh. <laughs> this, is why, this is why Ephesians says, do not be drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So every day, we're being filled with something. Someone will say, well, mm-hmm. Well, look at your neighbor and say, that's a good preaching. Tell him, say, he's talking to me. The metaphor of the oil of the Holy Spirit, you can find all through the Bible, the oil being a symbol of God's Holy Spirit. It was said in Psalms 23, 5, David wrote, he said, he anoints my head with oil. And my cup, how many know a cup is a vessel? And my cup runneth over. First Samuel 16, when David was anointed by Samuel, verse 13, it says this, that Samuel took a horn of oil, someone say oil, and he anointed David in the midst of his brothers. And the Bible says that in that moment, the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Psalm 92, David wrote, you have poured fresh oil on me. How many need some fresh oil today? You're a vessel. God's plan is to fill you with the Holy Spirit and power. God's plan is to anoint you so you can be useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Jesus himself was anointed. In the New Testament, it says this, that Jesus himself proclaimed, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do what? To preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed. Someone say anointed. He anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, that was for Jesus. Let me tell you something. There's not two Holy Spirits. We don't have, Jesus didn't have a greater impartation of the Holy Spirit. Yes, he was Christ. Yes, he fulfilled the will of God on this earth. Yes, he was a mirror reflection of God the Father. But I tell you, the same Holy Spirit that anointed Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that he poured out when he ascended to the heavenly realm. He didn't give us a different Holy Spirit. He gave us the same person of the Holy Spirit. He gave us God Almighty, and he poured it out in Acts chapter 2 when he ascended to the heavenly realm. The disciples stared up. The angel came and said, what are you doing, man? 
They're hanging out in the upper room for 10 days. And all of a sudden, <sighs> blows into the room. Are you hearing me? Uh, tongues of fire came on them. Some will say the anointing. And it spills out from there onto the streets. People mocking and laughing. Peter stands up. First he was weak, now he's strong. Why? Because his vessel got filled. Peter stands up and preaches. These men aren't drunk as you suppose because it's only 9 a.m. But this is what the prophet Joel spoke about. See, it was poured out in that day when Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. He said, it's to your advantage that I leave so that when I go, the helper can come, the Holy Ghost, the paraclete. See, if Jesus was here, we'd have no need for the outpouring. We'd have no need for the oil of the Holy Spirit. But he's not here. He's at the right hand of God. Now, yes, when two or three are gathered in his name, he's in the midst of them. But Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's our intercessor. He's our advocate. He talked to the Father on our behalf and said, Lord, now's the time. Release the Holy Ghost. And it came upon the church. And the church was birthed in the book of Acts. The problem is we look at the book of Acts and we say, wow, yeah, it was just for that day. Oh, no. If you ever hear anybody tell you, well, it was just for the apostles, it's, I mean, how, much, how stupid can you be? There was 120 in the upper room. Can you say amen? Well, it was only for the upper room. How stupid can you be? I don't know what Bible you're reading, but you get to Acts 10, and it was poured out upon the Gentiles as Peter spoke to the Gentiles. He didn't even pray for them. He didn't even lay hands on them. God sovereignly did it, poured it out upon non-Jewish people, and he says this in the Bible. He says, we knew it because that they received the gift of the Holy Spirit because we heard them speaking in other tongues. And how many know the Bible says in Corinthians, when that which is perfect comes, we'll no longer have, these things will cease. We'll no longer have need of these things. That's another, that, you know, that's another point that some organizations would like to use. Well, you know, it's ceased. Read your stinking Bible. It says when that which, has per, which is perfect comes. Has Jesus returned yet? So guess what, Church. The Holy Spirit is still being poured out today. Can you say amen? amen? And it will continue to be poured out upon a people who will become vessels of honor. I've been saying this as I travel in this last two weeks. Maybe you saw it on social media if you're friends. So if God's accomplished everything through Christ, through the cross, through his resurrection, took the keys of Hades and death, ascended to the right hand of God far above every principality, power, might, dominion. His name is above every name. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. Philippians 2 says that it's at the name of Jesus. Listen to this. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Those in heaven, on earth, and every foul thing from under the earth. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. So if, if Jesus has accomplished this all, someone say, it is finished. It is completed. And if he has not returned yet, and we're still in this dispensation of time, of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, then any limitation, any restriction, or any hindrance to seeing the book of Acts manifested in our midst, and in our cities, and in our nation, church, it's on us. Somebody say amen. amen. It's not on God. It's not God's fault. You know, it's interesting when Elisha asked for the double portion to Elijah, you know what Elijah's first response was? You've asked for a hard thing. Not hard for God, was it? But he asked for a hard thing because it would cost him everything. 
It would cost him to not leave the prophet's side until he was taken to heaven and the mantle fell. He had to go to Bethel. He had to go to Jericho. He had to go to Jordan. Every time the Elijah, Elijah says, oh, stay here, please. The Lord's sending me on. No, no. As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I'll not leave you. It was a hard thing because he had to give him his everything. It was a hard thing because it cost him everything. So for God to pour out his spirit in this last hour in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania, and in this church, any limitation, restriction, or hindrance thereof is on us, church. I tell you it's a hard thing why because it costs us everything to be a vessel of honor that's acceptable unto God ready to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit can you say hallelujah so what steps can we learn from this woman that received heavenly oil if you're taking notes number one you say was that the introduction yeah kind of <laughs> number one she placed a demand on the anointing Verse 1 says that a certain widow of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out. Some will say cry out. She cried out to Elisha, and she said, the creditor is coming, and he's coming to take my two sons as slaves. So in this woman's desperation, some will say desperation. desperation. Some will say hunger. hunger. Some will say thirst. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. What are we talking about? Being filled. What did God fill? Vessels. What does God still fill today? Vessels. Vessels of gold. Vessels of silver that are useful for the master. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. She placed a demand on the anointing. She cried out to, in her day, would have been the head of the church or the head of the organization. She was a wife of the sons of the prophet's husband who died. She was a wife of a man that, that operated with the sons of the prophets. So she goes to Elisha, who's basically the chief prophet in the day. Elisha being the successor of Elijah. Now he's inherited this school of the prophets. This woman was wise enough to understand the answers that I need the, 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 the supply that I need, it's found, hear me, it's found at the head of the church. Ephesians chapter 5 tells us that Christ is the head of the church. I know that it's, it's kind of natural for human beings and Christians to look to certain ministries, certain evangelists, certain what I call anomalies. Man, they really move in the gifts. My God, they, they're anointed. And I know there's this tendency to try to, like, like a fly goes to honey, you know, try to attach yourself. And that, there's, listen, there's great impartation through some ministries. Don't misread what I'm telling you this morning. But I tell you, when it comes to you being filled with the heavenly oil of the Holy Spirit and power and to you being anointed, the Bible is very, 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 very clear on this, that there's only one man who sandal straps I'm not worthy to loose, John the Baptist said. He said, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. It's Jesus. Somebody say his name, Jesus. What are you preaching right now? I'm preaching Jesus. I'm preaching the son of God who's alive forevermore. I'm preaching the one who's living right now, looking down upon the church, and he's looking for someone to place a demand on the anointing. He's looking for someone to strike the rock of Jesus, just as they struck the rock in the wilderness and water flowed out. That rock that followed them in the wilderness, 1 Corinthians 10 tells us, that rock was Jesus Christ. He's looking for somebody who's thirsty like Exodus 17. They had no water. They had nothing to drink, and they contended with Moses and they contended with the man of God, and they cried out for something to drink. Yes. That rock that followed them in the wilderness, that outflowed water, all who were thirsty drank. That rock was Christ, 1 Corinthians 10 tells us. Yeah, there's some great ministries out there, but I tell you, there's a divine impartation of the Holy Ghost and fire for every person in the sound of my voice. It does not come from Austin Jones. It does not come from any ministry. It comes from Jesus. And that woman, in her desperation, she cried out to the head of the church in her day. 
How many can see the type here? How many can see the metaphor here? Christ is still and will always be forevermore the head of the church. Lift your hands to Jesus right now, the head of the church, and just thank him. He's still the head of the church. Thank him. He's still the head of this church. Thank him that he is the head of all things. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I want you to put yourself in this woman's shoes for a moment. She has two sons. How many, how many ladies here, you don't have a son and a daughter, you have two sons? Awesome. I have two boys too. Two sons, creditors coming to take them, steal them. You owe me money. You know, the creditor, the creditor here we can look at as the enemy coming to steal her sons. She has nothing to be of a defense even, nothing to stop it. Put yourself in her shoes. Think of, think of the desperation in that mother's heart about to lose. Not just her sons, but those sons could work for her. Those sons could take care of her when she's older. I mean, those sons could plow the field. Those, those, sons, those sons were her livelihood as well. Just think for a moment, the desperation knowing that her sons are going to be taken from her. She cried out. Let me ask you this. What happened to the desperation and the hunger in the American church. Where did it go? We've traded so much in the American church for what Jesus really wants from us. Happy to come to church on Sunday and put your Sunday, Sunday smile on. How you doing, brother? I'm doing great. When your life is hell. <laughs> Put a few dollars in the plate. Hopefully that satisfies. <laughs> when the oil was filled in the woman's vessels, what did Elisha say? Go pay off your debts and live on the rest, and you and your sons shall live. I want you to get this metaphor for a moment. The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And the only thing that God wants his church to get a hold of, to push back darkness, is that others might live. Are you catching what I'm pitching for a moment? There's lives around us slipping into eternity of damnation and hell. There's people right now. The enemy is stealing, killing, and destroying their lives, and God wants to fill vessels of honor today, not tomorrow, today. He wants to fill vessels of honor that you can now have something to give. Matthew 10, 7, and 8. As you go, Jesus said. Someone say, look at your neighbor, say, go. go. Notice it doesn't say sit. <laughs> As you go. You know, you may have a great ministry of intercessory prayer. You may have a, a great ministry of worship. We are called to go. We are called to preach his name. We are called to rescue the sinner. And the spirit of the sovereign Lord wants to anoint you to set the captives free. Can you say Amen. She had something to give to rescue her children. Though their sons might not die, but they might live. When you read him for the sake of time, I'll not turn there. I'll just give you the story. Luke 11, for example. Jesus speaking of the Holy Spirit. He's not speaking on anything else. Listen, he's not talking about divine healing. He's not talking about salvation. He's talking about if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit. But in the context of receiving the Holy Spirit, Jesus says this, that there's a man who had some guests come to his house. He has nothing to feed them, nothing to offer them. But now I'm going to give you the Austin version. Can you, can you go with me? This isn't heresy, it's the story. But I'm going to give it to you a little bit with some highlights in it. He smelled some bread next door. His neighbor was over there baking loaves all day. He, he caught wind of it. He said, you know what? My friends are on a journey. They're staying with me. I don't have any bread to feed them. I have nothing to give them. But I heard my neighbor, I, I just heard he had bread. I smelled it, man. I know it's in there. I know, I'm, oh, I, as sure as I stay, I know it's in there. So he goes over, he knocks at his neighbor, says, hey, 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 Johnny. Man, I know you got bread in there. Listen, I got people, they came on a long journey. They're weary, they're tired, they're worn out. They're, they, they need some nourishment. They need some... Hey, 
give me that bread. Go away. The Bible says, I'm in bed. My feet are up. My kids are in bed. I cannot arise and give you. The guy's like, dude, did you hear what I said? I need that bread, man. Go away. Jesus said this. He said, but because of his persistence, it's like the leaky faucet, man. Doop, 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 doop. <laughs> it just drives you nuts. <laughs> I've never done that preaching. <laughs> but I feel the Holy Ghost on it. <laughs> the irritation and the persistence gets to the guy. He gets up out of bed, says, dude, just take it. The guy goes home. Here's the picture. He now has something to give. He now has something to strengthen those around him. He now has something to offer that can take them on their journey a little bit further. Are you hearing me today, church? You are called to be a vessel of honor that gets filled up and receives heavenly oil and spills out and overflows into another vessel so you can help somebody else and give them just what they need. Can you say amen? But where's the persistence in the church? How is it that complacency and satisfaction easily so creeps in? Well, that was a good message, and some of you might take it home and just say, well, that was, man, I like, kind of like that preacher, and just take it and never really do anything about it. Where's the persistence? Where's the hunger? Where's the thirst? Where's the demand on Jesus? I tell you right now, if the church in America will just get back to Jesus and get back to the basics of really just seeking him with all of their heart, did he not say, if you'll seek me, Jeremiah says, with all of your heart, you will find me. That's why Jesus said you've got to ask, you've got to seek, and you've got to knock. Amen? Amen. Look at your neighbor say, persistence. Tell them this, say, persistence reveals the promise. Amen? Amen? Do you know what we need in America? We need the church to get on fire. Yes. You know what the problem is? Most of the church sits back and looks at all the social problems today and the agendas of today, and all they do is complain about it. When in reality, they just need to get a hold of the Jesus. They need to strike the rock of Jesus. They need to cry out to Jesus, get filled with the Holy Ghost, and do something about it. I believe we could be on the precipice of the greatest move of God America's ever seen. If the church, if the church will cleanse itself from the latter, depart from iniquity, and serve the Lord with all of their heart, and cry out to Jesus with hands lifted, and not move from that place till you get something from the heavenly realm of divine impartation. It'll change you. It'll change your family. It'll change your city. It'll change your church. It'll change your region. But the truth is, many of us even here, and many of us in the Church of America, have nothing to give. Let me tell you what it takes to cast out a devil. It takes a greater spirit at work on the inside of you to cast out a devil. Can you say amen? amen? And Jesus said, cast out devils, for freely you have received, freely give. It's time to wake up and recognize, you know what? I'm not giving because I haven't been receiving. We need to be receiving. Amen? Say this with me. She... Placed a demand on Jesus, the head of the church. The second thing that she did, the man of God told her, said, go everywhere and find empty vessels. Someone say everywhere. everywhere. Someone say empty. empty. Can I tell you what Jesus wants the most from all of us, including this preacher right here? He wants us to empty ourselves of ourselves. And to take it one step further and this is a choice let me tell you something when it comes to your heart it's a choice and the choice that he's wanting the church to make is for Jesus to go everywhere in here 
Do you know Hebrews 10 says this, that we can come boldly. You with me? Hebrews 10 says we can go boldly. Everybody say boldly. Into the throne. Into the glory. Into the holiest place. You get that picture for a moment? Through the veil, his flesh, which was torn, we can access the divine realm, the glory of God, right? Do you know what that Greek word boldly actually translates? Without concealment and naked. Think of this. What God wants from us the most is what he designed in the Garden of Eden. How did he make Adam and Eve? Naked and unashamed. Are you hearing me? See, we're going, we're going everywhere right now. Are you hearing me? You know what God wants from you and I? If you're going to be a vessel, no, truly, no, make no mistake, you guys genuinely want to be vessels of honor, useful for the master, right? If you're going to be a vessel of honor, useful for the master, filled with heavenly oil and anointed by God and used by God and fulfill your divine calling and fulfill your, the will of God for your life, you have to be a life that is naked and unashamed before God, uh, uh, empty of yourself, saying, Holy Spirit, have your way in me. It's more than just getting filled with the heavenly oil. It's about being transformed by that oil. It's about not just the gifts of the Spirit. It's about the fruits of the Spirit. Can you say amen? Amen. It's about a life changed, a life transformed, a life being conformed into the image of Jesus. Amen. So it says, Lord, the bitterness, God, you, you, you can go there. Lord, the sexual abuse, yep, you can go there too. Lord, the pain of fatherlessness that was in my life. Yes, Jesus, please go there because it jacked my life up. Can you say amen? You glad you came to church today? Yeah. Say this when we say iniquity. I mentioned this in the first service that, you know, when I was in Alaska before I took this two week trip, trip down south, we're so far disconnected out there. Like, I, I'm not here all the time. I can't, you know, pick up everything. But I asked the Lord, I said, God, what, what's really hindering the American church? Because I want to speak to it, you know? And the Lord spoke to me very clearly. He said, my people are so filled with other things that I can't fill them. Say this with me. Say, anyone, anyone. who names Christ, who names Christ. Depart, depart from iniquity. Now, for the sake of time, if you want to turn there, you can, but it, just listen to this. Psalms 32 says this. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven. Aren't you thankful that God forgives us of our sins and transgressions? Whose sin is covered. Say this. Say transgression. transgression. Say sin. sin. And then the third one is this in verse 2. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Transgression, sin, and iniquity. Most Christians don't realize sin is actually not just sin. There's actually three levels of sin according to the Bible, and some sin holds a greater consequence than others. It's the truth. Number one, the Bible says transgressions. Say transgressions. So transgressions are when you just, you, you just made a failure. I mean, you, you weren't planning on it. You didn't expect it. Now, listen, if, you, if you've got, like, plans to sin when you walk out of this door today, like, you're already, like, premeditated sin, you need to get saved today. Can you say amen? <laughs> I said you need to get saved. <laughs> So transgressions are, man, I, I missed the mark, Lord. Man, I just, I wish I didn't do that. It just, it happened. That's a transgression. Aren't you thankful the blood of Jesus forgives us, washes us, cleanses us? Sin, the Bible says, he that knows to do right and does not do it, to him it is sin. You know, there may be things in your life that, are, that you would consider sin that somebody else wouldn't even consider sin. But it's the issue of the, of the heart. Are you hearing me? Like, you know, there's, there's things in my life. I hold myself to a standard, honestly, that like I've been around long enough, but most people, but I don't, I don't judge people. I don't put people down. I just know that the things God's called me to, and I know every time if I don't do something right, it's sin unto me. Are you with me? That's sin, number two. When you know to do what's right, but you don't do it, and you do it anyway, that's sin. Transgressions are like, man, oh, it just fell out of my mouth. I shouldn't have said it, shouldn't have done it. The third, someone say iniquity. Iniquity is a different level of sin. 
And it's the most severe level of sin. And what does 2 Timothy say to be a vessel of honor, useful for the master? You have to what? Cleanse yourself from the latter and, help me out, depart from iniquity. Am I helping anybody yet? Iniquity is this. It's idolatry. It is the sin of the heart. It's when your heart is filled with something other than Jesus. Not that you don't believe in Jesus, not that you're not saved, not that you've made a confession unto salvation and you know heaven's your home. It's when you allow things to get in the place of Jesus. It's, a, it's, it's, that, it's that place in your heart where you, you kind of put Jesus in the back burner and this is kind of more important, right? Now, am I preaching to anybody now? To be a vessel of honor, useful for the master, the Bible calls us to depart from that right there. And iniquity is Exodus 20 in the Ten Commandments, church. The Ten Commandments when Jesus said, you'll not have any gods before me. You'll have no other before me. And they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment of all? That you'll love the Lord God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. That you give, your, you give Jesus your everything. Amen? That's how you depart from iniquity. Now Psalms, I believe it's Psalm 66 says this. I believe it's verse 18. Listen to this. I'm gonna kind of set you up for something, but how many have ever heard Jesus hears everybody when they pray? Well, God hears everyone when we pray. You've heard that? Let me see your hand if you've heard that. Yeah, I just set you up, man. Listen to Psalm 68, 18. David said, I cried to the Lord with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. But if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You notice I didn't say that. The Bible says it. God's word says it. The truth is God doesn't hear everyone. The truth is you could name the name of Christ. You could put Christian on your forehead. You can pray all day long and God's not answering your prayers. God's not hearing your prayers. Because he said, if I regard iniquity, if I hang on to iniquity in my heart, the Lord cannot hear me. What God is calling the church to in this last hour before the return of Christ in America right now, number one, we better wake up and blow the trumpet. He's about to return, and we better snap out of this slumber that we've been in and this complacency, and we've got to get to the place where we understand there are things in my spirit and in my heart and in the church that has come before the Lord Jesus Christ. We wonder where the outpouring is. You know? I know the Bible says that he'll pour out his spirit. Where's the outpouring? Where's the book of Acts? Why are we not seeing it manifest? I asked the Lord that question. Why, Lord? Why are we not seeing the book of Acts manifested today? Why are we not seeing Bible stories become a reality today? I tell you, on some level, I'm seeing it. But I'm asking the church as a whole, why is the church not seeing it? The Lord said because of idolatry. Idolatry has crept into the heart. And then the Lord took it another step further. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this. I could pick like any idols, right? Like, you know, and I don't want to get into too many, but this is where I really felt like the Lord said has become one of the major idols in the church in America right now. T-I-M-E, time. Our time. Never forget, and it just came to me, this, this African brother years ago that prayed and prophesied over my wife and I. He was from Nigeria. I'll never forget, he used this acrostic, busy. B-U-S-Y, being under Satan's yoke. <laughs> Most American Christians are doing this constantly. Man, I've been in places asked to come preach, asked to come deliver the word of the Lord, asked to come and pray for people with miracles. And you get there and they say, you've got 28 minutes and we're out of here in 60. You understand? Like since when is, you know, my life on God, you know, since when is the ministry on my time frame? Last time I read the Bible, he's asked to give us some, give him a whole day. Last time I read the Bible, he said, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Someone say Ten Commandments. 
So let's say it again, Ten Commandments. And we wonder why we're not seeing the divine manifestation of God as in Bible days. Could it be that the church has allowed idolatry to creep into the heart? And we're praying and we're believing and we're praying, but God's not hearing us. Let me remind you of 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18, Israel had a problem. Do you know what it was? No outpouring. The heavens were shut up, the Bible says. There was, there was not even moisture or dew on the ground for three and a half years. Do you know why? It's because the prophet Elijah declared it. Do you know why he declared it? Because of iniquity that came into God's people. When you study out Mount Carmel, straight wickedness, man. Mount Carmel was the base, or the base of Mount Carmel was where the temples of Baal and Asher were established. There would be public drunken orgies, sexual immorality to an extreme, wickedness. And God's people were partaking in these things. But on the back burner, one thing you find in Israel's history, you never find them actually turning away from Yahweh or the one true God. It's like, it's like we, we, we love Yahweh. We know, we know there's a God and, you know, Elohim or whatever you want to call, you know, Yahweh. And we have our Jewish traditions in the system he's given us to worship with sacrifices and all of it. But, but we're going to partake on this over here for a little while as well. And Jezebel came in. How many know Jezebel's a bad name? Amen. Don't ever name your daughter Jezebel. Someone say, praise the Lord. So they're, 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 they're allowing idolatry and iniquity. Think of this, friend. Three and a half years, there's no outpouring. There's no former rain. There's no latter rain. There's no productivity. There's no fruitfulness. Are you catching what I'm pitching for a moment? It was the sin of iniquity that caused the heavens to be shut up. You know what we need the most right now? We don't need to be complaining about politics. We don't need to be complaining about Republican or Democrat or social issues of the day. We don't need to be complaining. Yes, we need to address them, but we need to get filled with the Holy Ghost and fulfill the plan and the purpose of God to preach the gospel, rescue the sinner. You know what fixes those people you complain about? Jesus fixes them. Someone shout amen. amen. Look at your neighbors and smile. Say, man, I'm glad you came to church today. He said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I'm going to read something to you. I, I wasn't going to read this, but I'm going to read it. Amos 5. Amos 5. I, and I'm not going to really expound on it. I'm just going to read it. Because I want you to hear what Amos said. Amos was a prophet. You know what was Israel's problem? Someone say iniquity. Someone say idolatry. Listen to what Amos says, church. Amos 5.21, speaking on behalf of the Lord, he says, I hate and I despise your feasts. I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I'll not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. But let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. What God's looking for is someone to set themselves on fire with holiness and righteousness, cleansing themselves from the latter, departing from iniquity. And how many know that's the cries that God's going to hear? That when you place a demand on the anointing from a place of a true heart, for those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in and when you approach with truth and nakedness and boldness, I tell you, that's a heart and that's a life that God will not turn away. And when we get real with God, with the junk in our lives, and we get real with God with our emotions, our pain, our hurt, our idols, and we cast it down before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I tell you, when we let righteousness run like a river, that's when heavenly oil flows.
God used Elijah to call fire down from heaven. The moment the execution of the prophets of Baal and the execution of Asherah, the moment there was an execution of idolatry and wickedness and it was cast down, that's when it began to rain again. My God, are you catching this? The outpouring comes. What God wants to deal with right now in the American church is the heart, man. We're so full of junk. It's things that aren't even, you know, things that aren't sinful even. But yet we're full of it. I said it first service, like social media. I mean, it's not, yeah, I mean, it could be sinful. You got to be careful. But I mean, social media is a great tool to network and be used and connect with people. All that great stuff. But you could, you could so consume your life. I dare you. If you haven't done it, use the screen time thing where it tells you like your screen time for the week. It'll blow your mind how much time we spend on those devices. And most of what we're doing on those devices have no, have no, listen, will produce nothing in eternity. No eternal value whatsoever. But we're consuming our lives with these things. And now I, I, I see, it shocked me. I actually kind of like got sick to my stomach when I saw it. Now there's this thing like binge watching. You ever hear that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I heard of that. You know, sign up for Netflix, binge watch today. Last time I heard the word binge, I wasn't serving Jesus. Are you with me? I mean, there's some great, great movies out there. There's some not so great movies out there. Can you say amen? amen? We've watched a few recently that I've really enjoyed. I mean, good godly movies. Sit down with the kids and watch. They've been pretty good. But you, even though it could be good, I mean, you have to be careful that you're not consumed and so full of the things of this world that have no eternal value. But you're filling yourself with righteousness and you're letting justice run like a mighty river and you're saying, God, set me on fire. Lord, I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm coming to you, the head of the church. I'm placing a demand on you. I'm cleansing myself from the ladder and I'm saying, Jesus, all I want is you. Jesus, go everywhere in me. I'm coming empty. I empty my will. I empty myself. I empty my, my plans, my purposes, my dreams. It's all gone for you, Jesus. People so consumed with their job of just getting to the next level. I'm preaching to somebody right now. I'm picking that up in the spirit. You're consumed how you can get to the next level. It's consuming you. Hear me. Get some consumed with Jesus and let his favor come on you. Amen? God will always do for you what you can't do for yourself. That's why. That's how he saved us. We couldn't save ourselves and he did it for us. Can you say amen? amen. And lastly, this won't be long. The divine increase in her life came in the secret place. Someone say, shut the door. The, the prophet said, shut the door. Get inside and shut the door. The divine increase and the filling of the vessels came in the secret place with God. The intimate place with Jesus. Someone say intimate. In Joel chapter 2, before you get to the, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, prior to that, Joel says, rend your heart, not your garments. You know what that means? Let Jesus go everywhere and stop going through the motions. That's what that means. The tearing of the garments was just a spiritual act. Stop going to church on Sunday, maybe showing up, you know, once every six months outside of that. Stop going through the motions. Get real with Jesus. Rend your heart, not your garments. A few verses later, it goes on to tell us this. He says, and, and let the bridegroom come out to meet the bride from her dressing room. I kind of laughed the first service. I, I, I was preaching more like my hair was on fire first service. But when the bride and the bridegroom meet on the wedding day, how many know things go down, if you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Now, young people, if things are going down and you ain't married, don't 
Come on. Come on. Someone say amen. amen. I said, if things going down and you ain't married, get married. Get it right. Get right with God. The Bible says no fornicator will have their place in the kingdom of heaven. Do you feel the call of holiness here? Do you feel the call of the Spirit saying, come deeper, go further than you've ever gone? Do you feel Jesus just saying, come up higher, meet the bridegroom, because the Bible says we're the bride of Christ. And we're called to that place of intimacy with Jesus. I'm a husband. I can't be intimate with my wife if there's garbage in my heart that's not exposed with her. If I'm carrying things and we're not talking about it, we're not communicating, there's not real intimacy there. But when we're real with one another and we love one another, there's a, there's a genuine connection of intimacy. There's an intimate place with Jesus. It's not a place of condemnation. It's not a place of, oh, I'm out to get. It's a place of come up higher, son. Come up higher, daughter. Come close to my heart. Because if you'll draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. And it's in that place where divine increase came. If you want to be used by God, a vessel of honor, you want to be used by God as a vessel of gold and silver, you have to learn to find the secret place. You have to learn to turn down the volume of life. Oh, I'm busy, pastor. I can't do that. That's an idol, man. Cast that thing down. Now, listen, I understand. You know, some people work jobs. They don't have an option like overtime hours. I get it. I, I used to work as a pipe welder. I mean, I, there was things I did not have an option with. Like, I had to be there. I had to put in those extra four hours, whatever. But if you're looking for more time to gain more money and it's keeping you out of the house of God and it's keeping you away from Jesus, I tell you, that thing's an idol. And your time has become money and money is a God. Yeah, right. Jesus said you can't serve God and money both because you'll love the one and you'll hate the other. Time is money. Well, I'm not a lover of money, no, but you're a lover of your time. Time is Look at your neighbor say, be careful. be careful. Tell him, say, Jesus is calling you. He's calling you higher. He's calling you closer. Can you say amen? I can't tell you, even, even since I've been, it breaks my heart, man. I'll be honest with you. I have friends that I grew up with in Perry County, close friends. I was the first to get saved. And as the years go by, they start getting saved one by one. Come to hear me preach when I'm, when I'm around. They're not here today. And just as a result of, you know, not just our ministry, but other ministries, they've received the fire of the Holy Spirit. And they're, they're so frustrated. My friends right now are so frustrated in central Pennsylvania. Why is the church asleep, man? There's so much more. And they don't, it's like, I don't know what church to go to. I don't even know, I don't even know where I fit in. And, you know, they become this anomaly because they got the fire of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. That's sad, man. It's a sad day when people get filled with the fire of God and they can't find a church that even knows it. Are you hearing me? It's a sad day, man. Why? because we've let idolatry into the church. It's become more about entertainment. It's become more about just a system of, well, we'll get them in, we'll get them out. You know, they put their time in, they put their money. It's about big budgets, butts in the seats, and big buildings. Are you hearing me? Amen. We gotta get back to Jesus. Amen. I'm speaking prophetically today. We gotta get back to Jesus. Amen. We've gotta fall back in love with him. What did he have against the churches in Revelation? You left your first love. It was a problem. He said, repent, get it right. If we're going to see revival, it starts in the church, man. It starts with us saying, God, forgive us. Forgive us, genuinely forgive us of our sins. Can you say amen? amen. She placed a demand on the anointing. She said, I'm going I'm to strike that rock. Jesus. I'm going to hit the head of the church. The head of the church has what I need. How many know Jesus has what we need? A move of the Holy Spirit, a genuine move of the Holy Spirit that glorifies Christ 
it will always lead people to, to him. Can you say amen? Uh, when we're speaking of a move of God, a genuine move of God, hear me. It will do far more than any form of entertainment or any system of this world that says church has to be like this. Church has to, I tell you, a genuine move of God, it will bust all that up and it will do far more in a community and in people's lives than you could ever imagine. And do it quicker. I said do it quicker. I get bombarded on social media with these articles because they know I'm a pastor. You're targeted on social media. Seven best ways to build your church. Well, I found one in the book of Acts. It's Jesus. Keep tapping into Jesus. Keep receiving from Jesus, and the church will be built, and the gates of hell will not prevail. Can you say hallelujah? Hallelujah. Seven best ways to make your people feel comfortable. I was in a church years ago. I mean, it's like 10, 10 years ago. They were showing me this massive building. I was pretty impressed, actually. And I saw in the back wall, it said donation box. So I just politely asked, well, can you mind me asking, what's up with the donation box? Well, we don't take offerings in this church, and we don't preach on tithing because it might offend somebody. So we just put a donation box in the back and hope for the best. So you want to rob God's people from a divine increase of financial blessing because you're afraid you might talk about money and offend somebody. Give me a flipping break. <laughs> this, is, this is the day we live in. Some will say, cast it down. Some will say, Josiah. Josiah went through all the land and found every idol he could find, and he cast it down and established righteousness again. Have I gone too long, Pastor? Are we good? I'm starting to enjoy myself. Are you getting it? I'm giving you a key to a revival. I'm telling you, I'm giving you keys to a move of God. Real sustaining moves of God don't come with just an evangelist. Real sustaining moves of God, when the heart of the church says, oh, Jesus, we want you, and we want to see you move in our community. We want to see the lost and the broken healed. We want to see salvation come, and you genuinely weep with tears at the altar for souls, and you pray, and you ask God to fill you up and to use you. Make no mistake about it. You ask, you seek, you knock, you pursue, you're going to have a collision course with Jesus. That's how it works. Then the temptation comes, once you get it, to back off. Then the temptation comes when you get that power from on high and you're feeling it, man, and you're, God's starting to... Then, it, then, it, then you got to be careful because the Bible says don't grow at ease in Zion. you got to stay hungry. you got to stay thirsty. Amen? I've been doing this thing. I've been serving Jesus almost 20 years now. It's hard to believe. Just over 19 years. Gave my life to Christ. And I can look in my past. There's been times, man, idolatry's tried to creep in. There's been times. And by the way, let me, say what, let me tell you what I think is hilarious. Times of prayer and fasting. Well, I'm going to fast TV, Pastor. I'm going to fast social media for a day. Let me tell you something. Never once in the Bible was casting down an idol called fasting. Not once. Fasting was to abstain from food. Can you say amen? Well, I'm going to fast. No, no. Just quit eating for a while. Amen? We could all use a little bit of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a break from social media. I'm going to fast. No, no. Just kill the idol. Kill the idol. Some will say, kill the idol. Some will say, cast it down. Now speak like Jehu would. Cast it down. Bible says Jehu rode his chariot furiously to go cast down Jezebel. There's a place for some Jehus. Can you say amen? amen. 
We've named our church Van and Gnome the Jehu. True story. You know, two-wheel drive van in Alaska, you got to drive that thing furiously. <laughs> He's here. Listen to me. Jesus is here. You can have a good time in church. He's here. He's speaking to our hearts. This is a timely word for this house. This is a timely word for this church. And the best is truly yet to come. Do you believe it? Yeah. You believe it? Yes. I've given you the how-tos. How's it going to happen? Right here. You know, the issues of the heart are always a choice. That's what that's what God that's why God is real love. Love never demands, not love never forces. That's how we know God is a God of true, genuine love. I can't make my wife love me, she chooses to love me. How many know love's a choice? After 25 years of marriage, you're still choosing. Praise the Lord. He said, oh, you've been married 25 years, you know it's a choice. It's a choice. Concerning salvation, he didn't force you to get saved, but he gives you the choice. He gives you a choice to receive him, to repent of sin. That's real love. That's real love. Casting down idols, it's a choice, man. Some of you need a fresh encounter with God. And if you'd be honest with yourself, you can recognize, man, there's some things that have gotten in my life. So I'm not where I used to be because of this. Are you hearing me? Church isn't where it used to be because of this. Someone say, cast it down. It's a choice. Let's stand up on our feet. I could keep preaching for the next four hours, but I'm not going to. I'm going to ask you to lift both hands to heaven for a moment. Come on, just begin to call on the name of the Lord. Even now, let, let repentance come in your heart. Even now. You, you know, listen. I've just given a few things that could be idols. I mean, there's many things we could talk about. But let me remind you what the psalmist said. He said, who can ascend to the holy hill of God? Think of that. The holy hill of God. The mountain of God. The place of thunders, lightnings smoke like a furnace Moses in the glory who can ascend to the holy hill of God only he the Bible says that has clean hands and a pure heart that has not lifted up their soul to an idol that's exactly what scripture said and that's the Jacob generation so even now just begin to lift up your hands and just even now say Lord would you forgive us for allowing anything to take the place of you. Let me ask you, I mean, does he consume you every day? Does Jesus consume your thought life? Does he consume your heart? Does he consume you every day? Because that's where he wants to be. He doesn't want to play second base. He doesn't want to be tucked away, compartmentalized in your heart somewhere. That's what we like to do. We like to compartmentalize Jesus. Well, he's there, but he's back here. He's over here. I still have this over here, and that's okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. 99%'s not enough. He wants it all. Jesus wants it all. Well, I can have church on Sunday, and you know, Pastor, he's very gracious, and I can still keep living with my boyfriend. No, you can't. It's not enough. If we don't talk about these things, you'll get a different perspective from the world. But God calls us higher. God calls us closer. Repentance must come into the church again. If my people... Not the world. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. He said, I'll hear them from heaven. I'll forgive them of their sin and I'll heal their land. He didn't 
say the words, if my people. Revelation, speaking to the church, he said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone just opens the door and comes in to dine with me, I'll dine with them. I'll sup with them. Do you know what that means in the Greek, sup? It actually means intimate, blissful experience. Whoa. In fact, it actually literally translates this. The most blissful, intimate experience. He's not talking to the church or, or the sinners. He's talking to the church. He's talking to Christians. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Man, just have some intimate fellowship with me. Come up higher. Come up closer, son. I'm calling you to better things, a brighter future. And most importantly, I'm about to return, and I want to use you. I want you to be a vessel of honor, useful for the master. If you're here today, very clearly, listen, we're all going to repent today. But if you're here today, very clearly, you say, my life is not even right with God. I, I don't have Jesus as Savior in my life. I've been completely living for myself, distant and disconnected from God. I'm not asking you if you come to this church. I'm not asking you how many times you go to church. I'm asking you, do you really know Jesus as your Savior? Have you made a decision to repent of sin, turn your back on the world, and receive Christ? Receive Christ. Put your faith in Jesus. If you've not done that, you'd say, today's the day. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to get things right with God. Take your right hand and lift it high right now. Hold it up high. Yes, sir, in the back. Anybody else? Take your right, yes, sir, with the hat. Anybody else? You say, I want to give my life to Jesus today. Today's the day. Praise God. Here's what we're going to do. Those two hands lifted, I'm going to ask you to come meet me in the front. As these two men walk forward to give everything to Jesus today, church, you've got idols. You need to cast them down. You need to repent. You need to get Jesus in his rightful place. You need to return to your first love. As these two men come forward, come in behind them. We're all going to pray together. Come. Come, sir. Come. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus for a moment. Thank you, Jesus.